This is such a cool story. A lot of people don't realize this. Uh, he was a small time criminal. He was also a mailman and then he was a chauffeur. He drove bands to and from shows. He went from being one of these band's drivers to their lead singer, but not just any lead singer, one of the greatest rock singers in history. Because he jumped on stage one night when the band was playing instrumentals and he just started singing. The band was floored. This guy had chops. They turned this story, their rise to the top of the charts, into a song that became so synonymous with this lead singer that the band actually stopped performing this song when he passed on, out of respect for him. It's a signature sound, and it came from a very strange instrument. The compelling story is coming up next on Professor Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever spent like two or three hours walking around Blockbuster Video trying to find the right movie to watch back in the day, you're going to love this daily dollop of nostalgia. Every day we do it. Subscribe below right now. Make sure to click the bell so you never miss out. And also click up here for our new merch including our new Vintage Years collection designs. We just added some new ones. So it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. It's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. If you've ever been in a rock band, truer words have never been spoken. The phrase became an autobiography of perseverance and the signature song for Ronald Belford Scott better known by his stage name, Bon Scott, the great Bon Scott. Bon was a man who wanted to rock and roll with every fiber of his being, no matter how long it took to get there. As a teenager, Bon had brushes with the law that landed him a nine-month penance at the Riverbank Juvenile Institution. Before he entered the working class, Bon attempted to join the Australian Army, but he was rejected for being uh, socially maladjusted. Bon Scott took whatever job he could find just to make enough money to get by because what he really, what he really wanted to do was rock and roll. He was a postman, a bartender, and a truck packer before he started his band The Spectres in 1964 as the drummer and sometimes lead singer. In 66, the Spectres merged with another local group named the Winstons. Now, the Winstons fizzled, and Bon put together his next band called the Valentines. This is where he was a co-lead vocalist with Vince Lovegrove. It's hard to imagine Bon Scott in a bubblegum pop band, but that's what the Valentines were. Bon and his bandmates wore uh, wide-collared shirts, bell-bottoms. <laughs> Looking more like Herman's Hermits than uh, uh, anything in playing songs with titles like Nick Knack Paddywhack. After the merciful demise of the Valentines, Bon Scott segued to a country blues outfit called Fraternity. Fraternity actually became a pretty hot band in the clubs of Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, so the guys decided to move to London in an effort to build an audience in Europe in 1972. When the group settled in London, there were 18 people residing in the same small house. This included wives, children, and pets. It was a kind of communal existence they lived in Australia, except there was no money coming in at all. And London was a much more expensive place to live than was Sydney. The music scene in London had changed dramatically at that point uh, by the time Fraternity arrived. It was all about glam rock, and Fraternity couldn't get arrested. The band was deeply despondent over the lack of interest. Trying desperately to generate a spark, the band changed their name to Fang, and they landed some gigs opening for other London-based bands. And one of those gigs, Fang was on a bill that included the group Geordie. Now, Bon was, uh, he was very impressed with Geordie, the lead singer. There's a chap by the name of Brian Johnson. You might recall in an earlier uh, POR feature on ACDC that uh, Angus claimed after Bond joined ACDC, he once told him, if anything should happen to him, that Brian is your man. Baby, 
after the failure of the London experiment, fraternity, Fang split up, and uh, Bond moved back to Australia. Bond hacked around Sydney looking for the next opportunity to rock and roll. Uh, he took a utility job with the booking agency that his wife Irene worked at, doing whatever they needed him to do for like $10 a day. So his main responsibility at the agency was being a chauffeur for the artists that the agency represented, driving them about town for, like I said, $10 a night. Bond's life took a career-changing turn when he met ACDC in September of 1974. Uh, ACDC was part of a tour package with uh, Lou Reed and Stevie Wright, and on that fateful night, they were playing their own show at the Puraka Hotel. Imagine this scene. ACDC didn't have a singer that night. They were just playing instrumental versions of rock standards. Uh, Bond and his wife were in the audience at the Puraka uh, with his former Valentine's cohort, uh, Vince Lovelace. And Vince kept uh, you know, prodding Bond to get on stage with that band. Finally, Bond jumped on the stage, he grabbed a mic, and he started, you know, or he began to wail with Malcolm and Angus Young. After an official audition that was arranged by the eldest young brother, George, Bond was hired to replace Dave Evans as the lead vocalist for ACDC. Uh, Bond and the Youngs were all sons of Scotland, so there was an instant bond between the Youngs and their new frontman. Not only was it the dawn of a new era for Bond Scott, but it also marked the beginning of the ACDC that we all know and love. This episode is sponsored by Zenny Eyewear. Zenny specializes in helping you get the perfect pair of eyewear. First with the right frame size, which makes fit and comfort easy, and they recommend the best lenses based on your prescription. It's pretty amazing. You just make your selection, you put in your prescription, and choose your favorite features like blue blocks or anti-fog, anti-glare, and they deliver them right to your door. You gotta check it out at zenny.com. So it was Bond who brought what uh, Malcolm Young called the stick it to him attitude that the rest of the band had inside them. They just needed Bond to liberate it. ACDC's debut album with Bond Scott as the front man and primary lyricist was High Voltage, first released uh, only in Australia. That was in February of 1975. High Voltage, that was a big success in Oz. And it set the stage for one of ACDC's seminal albums, TNT, a harder edge rocker that came out once again as an Aussie only release December of 75. Now, TNT included some of the most beloved early material from ACDC, including the anthemic. It's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. The track was a retracing of Bond's personal journey while chasing his rock and roll dream. When Bond began writing, it's a long way to the top, uh, ACDC were still playing CD venues. It wasn't a song about drinking or chasing women. It was a de-glamorized introspection about the real challenges a musician faces to be in a band, to try to make it. make it all the way. It's a long way to the top. That connects with every musician, you know, who's ever lugged around a drum kit or been sleep deprived from white knuckle races to gig after gig making little or no money in the process. That song chronicles what actually happened to Bond during his rock and roll travels. He was robbed, he was assaulted, stoned, and cheated by greedy agents. The point of Bond's song is that a true rocker doesn't care about any of that. You know, you accept the hardships, you work your butt off, and you roll with the punches. That is, if you really want to rock and roll, which he did. It's a Long Way to the Top is not a typical ACDC track. It's quite unique for its openness, with each band member having the space to inject uh, valuable, robust dynamics. Phil Rudd on drums, Mark Evans on bass, and Malcolm Young's relentless rhythm guitar licks. But the most distinguishing feature of It's a Long Way to the Top is, of course, the ingenious placement of bagpipes. It 
it was big brother George Young that came up with the, the brainstorm, you know, to add bagpipes to the nearly finished track. It wasn't the first time that a rock record had used bagpipes, but it was a pretty novel concept. I believe the first rock record with bagpipes was uh, Sky Pilot by Eric Burden and the Animals. That was in 68. Now, George, who uh, co-produced the TNT album with his partner, Harry Vanda, he remembered that Bond was in a pipe band when he was a teenager. So he asked Bond to bust out the bagpipes for this track. Now, what George didn't realize was that Bond was not a bagpipe player. Bond knew how to play the flutes and the drums, but uh, not the pipes. Bond excitedly agreed to do it, though, but uh, he neglected to tell George uh, that he didn't know how to play him. Anyway, he quickly got a hold of some bagpipes and he took a crash course on how to play. You know, just like a Jedi using the Force, if you want to rock and roll, there is no can. There's only do or do not. Do or do not. There is no try. Bond approached the task of playing the pipes like he did everything else with crazy self-confidence. The bagpipe refrain that he performed on It's a Long Way to the Top with the help of tape loops, it became a riveting classic, even though he played it in the wrong key, apparently. Now, the call and response between Bond's bagpipes and Angus's lead guitar in the middle section of It's a Long Way to the Top is definitely a high point of the track, incredible. There is uh, further interplay between the pipes and the guitar during Angus' solo, which many regard as one of his top five solos. The pipes proved to be far too challenging to pull off live, though. It was basically scrapped after 30 concerts or so. To match the droning keys of the pipes, Angus and Malcolm had to constantly tune their guitars, which was a major pain. Even Bond, you know, grew tired of the hassle. So for their live shows, the band swapped the pipes for an extended Angus guitar solo. The last time ACDC uh, played the bagpipes, and they were played by Bond, was at St. Albans, Victoria, Australia. After performing the song, Bond sat the pipes down in the corner of the stage and they were destroyed by fans who pounced on him like a pack of wild dogs. The original music video for It's a Long Way to the Top, that shows the band playing in the back of a flatbed truck rolling down Swanston Street in Melbourne. <laughs> The clip also features the players from the Rats of Tobruk Pipe Band, including Kevin Conlon, who got the call from Bon Scott about appearing in that video. Such a classic video. You got to check it out on YouTube. I'll try to link to it. Uh, Conlon did not know Bon, and Bon didn't really know him, except that he was a piper. So Conlon recalled that Bon wanted to buy a set of bagpipes and have a few lessons. Conlon told Bond that it would cost over $1,000 and would take about 12 months or more of lessons to learn to play. Because Bond was only going to be miming for that video, the two settled on a couple of lessons so the Bond would look the part. It's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll has been remade by everybody from Motorhead. Lucinda Williams, Pat Boone, if you can believe that. It's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. To Jack Black, of course, in the movie School of Rock, Jack and the Kids gave a rousing rendition of the anthem at the very end there. But the song will always be on a pedestal for Bon Scott, illustrating the guts and the glory of the quest for rock and roll greatness. Sadly, Bon Scott died just shy of his 34th birthday. You know, when ACDC was on the verge of a phenomenal explosion that Bod would uh, sadly not be a part of. At least not in the flesh. The spirit of Bon Scott lives on with the legacy of ACDC epitomized by his opus, 
It's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. Out of deep respect for his fallen predecessor, uh, Brian Johnson elected not to perform the song at ACDC concerts for more than 20 years. Johnson picked up the torch when Bond died, of course, in 1980 and teamed with Angus, Malcolm, and Phil Rudd to carry on his legacy. Um, ACDC stayed on that onerous path to reach the top. They became one of the all-time biggest bands in rock and roll history. Bon Scott, who was posthumously rated number one on the list of the 100 greatest frontmen of all time by Classic Rock Magazine in 2004, he's undoubtedly in rock and roll heaven, looking down on his brothers with a, I'm sure, a mischievous smile and busting with pride as, after all these years, with all the changes in music, bands splitting up, new genres, new artists, ACDC still at the top of the game in rock and roll. Leave us a comment about the great Bon Scott and ACDC and this powerful, truly powerful rock anthem. What are your memories of this iconic song? Let us know in the comments. We'll have a good discussion. If you like this episode, be sure to check out our other videos on ACDC. Also, don't forget to subscribe below so that you never miss out on our videos. Check out our Patreon for even more content. And make sure to look at our new merch, including our latest additions to the Vintage Years Collection. We have the years 1967, 1981, and 1991. You voted on them. Just uh, check it out at ProfessorRock.com or up here. Help us keep the music alive. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.